Hi, this is Inky35, and today I wanted to talk to you about several different subjects, which I'm going to go through a lot of um, verses and chapters in the Bible to explain a lot of these gods that were supposed to exist during the time of the Jewish people with their story of them coming out of Egypt. Now before I get started, I just want to let people know what I'm doing. Um, there's a lot of people that think that I'm preaching. I am not preaching. I am comparing. So sometimes I will compare in the viewpoint of the religion of Christianity and what they think about these these beings and then I will also use them in contrast with in comparison with the Jewish belief system because everybody has to realize that the Jewish belief is not the Christian belief they are two completely different religions they are not the same religion and uh, Judaism existed before Christianity when they came out of Babylon this is when Judaism was created after the exile of Babylon when they came out with Ezra. So what I'm going to start doing, just so everyone knows that it doesn't matter with what I'm stating, whether you believe or you don't believe, it's the context that needs to be paid attention to with what I'm talking about. Um, of course, people can believe in whatever they want to believe, but I'm just letting you know that this has nothing to do with um, a belief, me trying to force a belief on someone or proselytize them. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just going to compare what I see through what has been written and the comparisons of who these gods are, which I'm about to show you. So I want everyone to know whether you think Moses really existed or you don't believe that any of these gods existed. It just doesn't matter because we're looking at context. That's what we're looking at. It doesn't matter if you think that they plagiarized or copied or any of this stuff because we can always get into that later where they got these motifs from. So we'll be able to just Take a look at what it's saying, what they're saying about their God that is supposed to be different about their God from these other gods. Now, there's a lot of ideologies on YouTube and, and all over the place, the internet, which are talking about that they believe that this God called Saturn is the God of the Hebrews which the Hebrews themselves actually <laughs> claim that this is not their God. And, but although there are some comparisons and motifs that match up, they aren't fully incorporated into the Hebrew Bible. And people will state that they believe that the Hebrews plagiarize like the ancient tales and all this stuff. I will get into all this. I just want people to understand that when I am doing this, that it's just taken the context. And please do not become offended because this is not what this is about. This is just to have, to open the mind to be able to understand who these gods are, who the Jews were actually talking about, and how they state that their God is not like these other gods although some accounts um, match certain things, but then of course the, the accounts of the Rosh Amr text just don't match with the Hebrew God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm gonna just start reading you some of the stuff that I have been writing about these gods and just go over some of these comparisons. So a lot of people with the Saturn L theory are claiming that the Hebrews God is Saturn. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the Saturn that they are claiming is the God of the Hebrews. They call this God Saturn L and 
they try to identify him with the Hebrews God because the Israelites in their own Bible, in the Jewish Bible, it states that they worship these gods. And it says that they were punished for it and it was an abomination to do these things. So here we go. So they also the Saturn L theorists try to equate Saturn as the Hebrew God by the star of Kiyun or by the Rimfan or by Sakuth. So this is who the star of Kiyun represents. Ninurta is Saturn and the star of Kiyun. They call him Sakuth and he is identified with Horon and he is also Malek and sometimes identified with Baal, Peor, a Moabite god. Now, if anybody looks at Numbers 25, 3 through 5, Deuteronomy 4, 3, Psalms 106, 28, Hosea 9, 10, and Amos 5, 26, which I will end up reading, but um, like it states here, Amos 5, 26 says, But ye have borne or did bear the tabernacle of your god, Moloch, and Kiyun. So while they were in the wilderness, they were carrying around this image and this idol of this god, Ninurta, in the desert. And it states that they did not know who God was when they came out of Egypt. So they were carrying around these images which had to do with these gods. In the uh, dictionary of deities and demons in the Bible, you can look this up by Carol von der Torn, Bob Becking, Peter Willem van der to Vanderhorst, W.F. Albright, the Canaanite god Horon. It states that Horon is depicted as a falcon clutching snakes in his talons. The reason lies in the identification with Horus. It's in the desert, he was worshipped as a god, protecting against the enemies coming from the desert. Horon was identified with Hermachus, the great sphinx, which Van Dyke in 1989, 65, and 68. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Numbers 20. Five, and this is what it states. This is when they're supposed to be out in the desert. Whether you believe they really were, it does not matter. This is the context. This is what needs to be rem remembered, the context. So it says, Numbers 25 states, While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to their sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods, so Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people and kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshiping Baal of Peor. So it mentioned gods, plural. So the other god that was mentioned here is a god by the name of Resheth. And this god is equated as Nurgle, who was a son of Enlil and an underworld deity. So these gods are actually ancient Anunnaki gods that came from the beginning of the ancient civilizations and they are moving through the land and this is who it is referencing. So these gods right there are in the desert. It states, in Numbers 25, 6 through 9, it states that after they had killed the idolaters, 
that the plagues that killed 24,000 people diminished. So is this due to the expulsion of the worshiping of the Reshef and the Sukkoth, which is called the burner and the ravenger from the camp? So let me explain who Reshef or Rimfan or Mikal or Mikal is. If you look in the Encyclopedia Britannica, in Hebrew, it's Reshef is known as the burner or the ravenger. He's also known as Eris and, and he's also called the scorcher. So he is an ancient West Semitic god of the plague and of the underworld and the companion of the goddess Anath, which is Arishkagel. And is the equivalent of the Babylonian god Nergal. He is also a war god and was represented as a bearded man brandishing an axe, which also, if anybody ever looks at Rimen, as you see here, you'll see him with the horns and you'll see him wielding the axe. His name is Rimen, which they also call a dad. So he's holding an axe and he's holding a shield and wearing a tall pointed headdress with the goat's or gazelle's head on his forehead. So Reshef was worshipped in and especially in Rosh Shamra, the place in which the Saturn L theorists like to claim as the god of the Hebrews. Byblos and Arsuf, later Apollonia near modern Tel Aviv, Yafo. So a lot, I just want to add right here so people understand that a lot of the people believe that the story of the Canaanites um, was presupposed before the Hebrews knew about anything about this. But in fact, there are scholars who see the differences in the word of the Tahom when it comes down to like their their battle of Yom and stuff like this, which I'll get into, but I just wanted to point something out. That those words, it shows that the Hebrew word Tahom actually presupposes the Canaanite word, which makes that story and that word older than what the myth actually um, stated is. So they already knew about this. So they didn't take anything from the Canaanite um, religion. They already knew about these stories. And that's another thing that the Saturn L theorists think that the Jews had, or the Hebrews, I should say, had borrowed from the Canaanite story of Baal and their tales, which if anybody ever reads the story of El and Baal and Mot and all this stuff, you're going to find out that it doesn't even actually sound anything like the Old Testament. And that's what people need to look at when they are cross-referencing things, not just pick a certain point that might sound just because it sounds like it might be the same story doesn't mean it is the same story so Reshef under the title of Mikal or Mechel um, he was worshipped at Beth Shean in eastern Palestine and at Ialium in Cyprus and Reshef was usually believed to be related to Mot which in Hebrew Mot means death the god of sterility and death, but he also seems to have been a god of well-being and fertility, and in that respect, he may have been a form of the god Baal. Reshef is also presented in Ugaritic as an archer, which is the same as Ninurta. So Rimfan is Saturn, and this is what the Bible states about Ninurta. It says, even in the New Testament, it says this. In Acts 7.43, it states, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rimphan, 
figures which you made to worship, I will carry you away, even beyond Babylon. So right here is showing that the God that was an abomination that they were worshiping was not the God of the Hebrews and that they were not to worship these deities. And it states that they were actually literally worshiping Saturn, which is Cayune. But this, this is another thing that people need to look at when it comes down to um, when did this Kiyun come about? Well, this started being directed in the um, Septuagint and in the Greek language because it wasn't really like related to Saturn until they started bringing together this stuff later with the with the Greek and Septuagint writings. So that's another thing that people need to look at if you're really interested in studying. And that when I say study, that means literally researching every single little crack and crevice that you possibly can about this stuff so you have a full understanding of everything around the surrounding area even down to the writings and the way they wrote it and that's what I do so he is also associated with the Egyptian god Renpu and if you want to look up Renpu you can so to investigate even further these gods, the Saturnal theorists project as the gods of the Israelites, a.k.a. the Hebrews. Um, I will introduce an even further revelation as to who the names and etymology of these names specifically are related to. So we have the Kateb, the Deber, and Mot. According to the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, it states... The term Kateb appears four times in the Old Testament, and its basic significance is destruction, perhaps etymologically, that which is cut off, though the context suggests that other nuances are present. Various scholars have translated it as plague or pestilence in the context of its parallel use with the god Reshef and Deber, this term has overtones of a divine name. So, Kazeb occurs once in the Ugaritic text, the KTU 1.5224, and may be a kinsman of Mott. And um, you can look up J.C. Demore, O Death, Where Is Thy Sing, ascribed to the Lord, Biblical, and other studies in the meaning of, in the memory of P.C. Craigie. You can look those up, but the text is broken up a bit. But anyway, let me read you Deuteronomy 32, 24. It states, they will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction and the teeth of beast. I will send upon them with venom and crawling things of the dust. So this right here is in reference of the people being bitten by venomous serpents in the desert to where Moses ended up erecting a bronze serpent staff for them to gaze upon, which was another Egyptian and ancient Mesopotamian god by the name of Nangishida. Even though Nangishida is an ancient Mesopotamian god, so people know that these tales ended up being learned through the trade routes down into Egypt. So when they started making these gods, um, they, they're the same gods, except they're named differently. So we see here that they did not call upon the Lord, their God in the desert for help, but upon the serpent demon lords of the underworld. And this is what it states about it in Numbers. It says, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient along the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. I guess they didn't like the manna. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and let it and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Does that mean that that serpent was the God of the Hebrews? No, because it's saying that the Lord directed him to make a pole with a bronze serpent which represented a serpent god, which I believe has a relation with Nangishida, who is a serpent god, and he also sits upon the throne of the underworld. So let us observe what this represents, which is the seraph which is the one who they would be looking upon. And a seraph is a fiery one or a burning one. And their form appears to have been human with the addition of wings. According to Frederick Delich and Hommel, they associate the seraphim with the Assyrian Sharapu, a name which in Canaan designated the Babylonian fire god Nergal. The seraphim then would be the flames in which this God manifested himself. So according to the Jewish encyclopedia, it states, according to this theory is that until now, no one has been able to show that the word seraph was ever used as a name of a God. And according to a third and more probable theory, the seraphim originally were serpents as the name implies. So obviously this power of this serpent had to do with a seraph a burning one or a shining one that's what they call them the nachash the shining one so serpents have always played a role in the ancient myths and folklore especially in the event in genesis and other sources like in the mesopotamian of myth of adapa and the food of life so I want to explain that the reason why I'm going here is because it's going to lead back to Ningishida. And a lot of people believe that, I know how this is going to sound crazy, but there are alien theorists. We have the alien theorist and we have the alien Gnostic theorists. And then we have the Saturn L theorist. So what I'm going to explain right here is um, what they're doing. We have these theorists that are trying to get away from the Old Testament to state that this God is Satan. Okay. And so some of the alien theorists are trying to get away from it as well because they had a belief in Jesus Christ and they used to be a Christian but now they're trying to because of what they're following um, they're actually literally going back to Thoth in Egypt to a place that Jesus is Thoth in Egypt and he's also Nagishida which is the serpent and so they're, doing, they're almost following like a Marcion type religious belief system because Marcion of Sinope ended up not believing that the Jewish God had anything to do with the Christian Jesus and that he didn't want to um, intermingle their belief system with Christianity. And mind you, he was the first one who ended up 
actually writing the first New Testament. And if anybody looks it up, I, I put out a couple videos on it um, and about the Gnostic sects that were running around after Jesus. But this is what I'm getting at. So they are trying to get their, they're drawing upon Marcion's belief and they're also drawing upon the belief of the Christians of Jesus and the Gnostics, but they're taking and removing him from the God of the Old Testament, which is supposed to be the father of Jesus. And now they are going all the way back into Egypt to say that this is their God, that Jesus is Thoth. This is what a lot of these people are saying and there's alien theorists that listen to like the lost book of Enki, Zachariah Sitchin another thing that they're using is the Maseroth and they're incorporating this all into the signs in the skies of Jesus supposed to be born from a heaven and the sun rose in the virgin all this other stuff if you if you just look at the Maseroth and look it up and read it you'll see what I'm talking about but this is their ideology and so they are stating that Jesus is this serpent, Nangishida. So let's see what Nangishida did. Nangishida is a serpent, like I said. So they're saying that Jesus is a serpent. This is what these theorists are saying. And so let's see who Nangishida is. So if you go back into the Sumerian myths about Adapa, he was greeted by two guardians of Anu's heavenly palace, and they were standing at the gates. This was Dumuzid and Nin Gishzida. Um, they were standing at the gates. So Ningisha is known for being a serpent, and is called the Lord or Serpent of the Good Tree. And in one of my prior videos, I think it was Satan's Family, The Greatest Deception, I said something like, so is he the serpent of the tree of good and evil? Because, listen, the, although not everything in the Bible is a literal um, recast, well, there are a lot of things that have been recast, but... A lot of the motifs have been recast into the events of the Adam myth or, or the story of Adam um, with this Adapa myth. So Adapa was literally a son of God who was one of the first men. He's called the first of the seven sages. And... He was literally the seed of this God. He he was Adam. He would be the Adamu or the Adam. Not the Lulu Amilu, not the other one, but the, the one that belonged to the line of God. And so he had gone to heaven before Anu because it states that he had broke the south wind. And that south wind that he had broken just so happened to be Ninlil. He broke the wing of Ninlil, which is Enlil's spouse. So if you look any of this stuff up, you'll you'll see what I'm saying. So he is taken up to heaven, and this serpent is standing at the gate, mind you. And the one who created him was Enki, which I call Anki. And people can't stand it when I say Anki, but that's just too bad. That's what I call him, A-N-K-I. And... I say it like that, and that's the way I'm always going to say it, so people need to get over it. But anyway, Anki ends up creating Adapa and also told him not to eat of or the water of life and the water of death, but he didn't say it that way because whatever they were going to offer him in heaven would have been their death. So when he, he told Adapa to dishevel himself before these gods and to wear like sackcloth and ashes. And he went before the gods and they offered him something to eat, which Ea told him, do not eat it. 
And when Anu saw that he wasn't eating the food, Ningisha tried to stand up to, to say that, did he really tell you not to eat this? Because Anu was like, why isn't he eating? Who told him not to do that? And that's almost like the reference in Genesis of where it states that the serpent said to, at, to Eve, um, did God really say that you should not eat of this? And, and said, and she said, yes, he said, the day you eat of it, we will die. Um, even though it says that in the Bible, and then the serpent says in the Genesis account says, well, you surely won't die. You'll become like one of us. So when you go back to the Adapa account, it states that Anu said, who told you not to do this? And it said that Ea, my Lord Ea told me, or Enki told me not to do this. So he thought it was funny that he was actually obeying his Lord and did not take of it. And so he offered him the bread and the water of life in heaven. This is Anu. And, but he would not take of it. So he was sent back down wherever the heaven was, but he was sent back down to earth. And obviously earth is the ground, the dust, the dirt. And he was, um, not, he missed the chance of immortality, but he was not to eat of that. And that's was Enki who told him not to. So in this event, Enki is the one who created mankind. He's the one who created this Adam. This Adam actually literally is his seed, his son. And he's called the first of the seven sages. So anyway, so the serpent that was at the gate would actually be Ningishida because he is the serpent. He's the serpent of the good tree. He's also called the Lord of the good tree. Now, in the Christian religion, they think that the serpent in the Genesis account is Satan. In the Jewish account, they don't believe that the serpent, the great old serpent in the garden was Satan. See, the this is what people need to get through their head. The Jewish people do not believe in a Satan the way that the Christians do. The Jewish people do not believe that Satan is this evil, wicked being outside of God. That all things are under the authority of God. This is what the Jews believe and that it only means adversary. So the Christians believe that there's like this adversary outside of the power of God because they're a fallen angel. And mind you, this is there, there is no accounts of the fallen angel in the Bible. None, zero zilch. This is all outside sources, which are called pseudopigraphas that are trying to explain what happen in thousands of years prior to it ever being written um, with the accounts of these sons of God. I'll have to make a video about it and I'll get into that later. But anyway, um, also there's something interesting about the word Ningishida, which Ningishida has the word N-I-N in front of the Geshida. So, N-I-N is a feminine form called Lady. So, it, is this Ningishida Lady Geshida? Because, why is there a Nin in the front? And, mind you, Demuzid is also there 
And so is this a lady that was there that would have something to do with the serpent? Even though the characters have been recreated in the biblical narrative. So, and then we know that the person that is there, the female part that would be there with Demuzi would be Inanna. That's something to get into. That's interesting. I think I'll get into that later. So, Nagishan is known for being a serpent and is called the Lord or Serpent of the Good Tree. And it states that Ningishida's mother would be Nin's son. Relating Ningishida to Ninazu. So, and he's also would be related hero of renown, Gilgamesh. Because Gilgamesh's mother was Nin's son as well. So, Ningish is known as the son of Ninazu and Ninsun, and his uncles consist of Nana, Nurgle, Ninurta, or Inbilulu, or Ningursu. So Ninurta, Inbilulu, or Ningursu are the same ones. That's Ninurta. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video right here. I will be continuing to upload videos about this subject on these gods and how it compares with the biblical narratives. I wanted to thank all my new subscribers and my subscribers that have been with me for a long time. I know I've been away for a while, but I plan on coming back and loading videos on a more consistent basis. I hope you guys are having a great evening and I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be talking to you soon. This is NQ35.